to the community. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Needham Free Public Library's presentation of True Crime Podcasting with Diane Godfrey and Jordan Rich. As you've been hearing from as we've been chatting before our start of this program, uh, Diane uh, has been a court reporter uh, for the last 30 years and is going to talk about the Massachusetts judiciary system, as well as uh, Jordan Rich, who was a staple in Boston broadcasting for decades. And I used to listen to his evening show that midnight to uh, whatever I am on WBZ radio. Um, both of them have been uh, doing podcasting. Their true crime podcasting has been a staple for the last few years. And tonight they're going to be talking about podcasting for, as well as, um, which is called All Rise and other things. So without further ado, continue onward, Diane and Jordan. Well, Hi, thank you. Go. Hello, uh, I'll kick things off just because there is, a, is an actual uh, format that we follow, believe it or not, uh, but we have a great time. Diane's terrific. Anyway, uh, in terms of questions, we'd love to take them uh, as we go along. The best thing to do is to question uh, write the question in the chat room area, and then that chat will come up on the screen and we'll be able to take those more likely at the end of our presentation. But anytime you have a question, that way there we don't speak over each other. Um, how many of you, well, I can only see a few, so I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm assuming most of you know what a podcast is by now. It's basically audio on demand. And Diane's right, I've been doing a bunch of them. Uh, we'll talk about specifically the one with Diane, but it's, it's a great uh, throwback to the good old days of radio. It's audio. It's not video for the most part. And uh, it's it's amazing what you can find. There are literally hundreds of thousands, probably almost in the millions of offerings on everything from gardening to uh, baseball to, in our case tonight, true crime, which is one of the top categories, very popular category that people love to search for. And we'll talk about why with Diane in a bit. But let me just set the stage. I'll be asking Diane some questions about what she's done on the podcast, but what she does in her job as a as a court reporter, very important job, sometimes well, often taken for granted. But I'll be asking her questions and sort of conducting an interview style show. So this is not going to be a lecture. It's going to be more fun and interactive. So once again, if you have questions, shoot them up on the uh, chat room screen and we'll get to them. So here's what's going on before we start. I taught a course uh, back a couple of years ago online during COVID to help people get started if they wanted to in the podcast world out of about 18 people. And they were all gung ho. There was only one who took up the mantle and took it to heart and did it seriously. And that's this lady, Diane Godfrey. And she's a hoot and, a, and we love working together. And I suggested and I don't want to shut up in a second here, but I suggested that, you know, why don't we work together and I'll lead you on and just be there to see be your gal or guy Friday. I wouldn't be a gal Friday. And so it's worked out really well. We've got uh, upwards of 25, close to 25 podcasts that are available on all podcast platforms. Just Google All Rise with Diane Godfrey and you'll be able to link to it on Apple, Google, Stitcher, et cetera. Okay, so it's up there and it's doing some good things and the numbers are building. Diane? How excited are you about doing this podcast? Very excited. It's the best thing that happened to me since sliced bread. <laughs> well, we should tell people before we get rolling, I mentioned the popularity. It's not just in the local area, people who know the Massachusetts system and all that. Diane, what kind of numbers are you getting right now? Well, we have a mechanism by which I can get onto this um, platform and naturally you have to pay every month, but it shows you where your listeners are. And I'm flabbergasted because when I read down the list, we've got, you know, actually most of them, not most of them, but we have a huge amount in the United States, but we've got 196 in Brazil. We have Russia, Cape Verde, Germany, Portugal, 
um, Australia, every corner of the planet, Indonesia, we have people listening. And, you know, I marvel at it. And I'm wondering to myself, in some of these instances, are they expats? Or like, are they, are they military people that are from Boston and they're just pining for the Boston accent? And they, you know, I don't know. Are they trying to hone their skills on English? But it's amazing how many people are, are tuning in. Well, Diane and I have talked about this, and, and I mentioned at the beginning, folks, that this is the number, if not the number one, then pretty close to the number one category in terms of interest. There was a podcast, Diane and company, uh, called Serial that PBS uh, launched about 10 years ago, eight years ago, and that became an overnight sensation, and people discovered it through NPR. And But true crime is, it is so popular. If you look at Netflix, or Hulu or any of these, you'll see documentary upon documentary, right, Diane, of serial killers and crazy crimes unsolved and that kind of stuff. So in your experience now doing this and then just talking to people at cocktail parties, remember those? Why do you think it's so fascinating? Why? I don't know. I, I don't know. I just think it's human nature that it, it's a, it's a, it's the curtain is peeled away and you get to peek behind the curtain of something that most people will never be a part of. And it's unusual, it's sensational. And I just think people have an, an insatiable appetite for it. Well, folks, I'm sure you're, you're able to respond in, in kind when I ask the question, have you ever been in court on the witness stand? That is a pretty moving and exciting and thrilling and scary opportunity. But even just being in court, most people never get there. Even jury duty, you kind of get sent home most of the time. So Diane's going to take us behind the scenes, and then we'll talk about some specific cases that are bizarre, and they really do make your hair stand on end. Diane, let's talk about what a court reporter is all about. What does your job entail, and what's true to the movies and not true to the movies in a courtroom? Well, so a, court, a court reporter is that person that you see sitting underneath a judge, you know, underneath the judge's bench at the front of the courtroom, not saying a word, but recording everything that happens. You keep a record of it. And after the trial or the hearing is done, upon request in another room at another time, that court reporter will sit in a room and transcribe what happened. And it's verbatim reporting. And you make what it looks to me like in high school when we'd have a book report, you know, that we had to get done. And it, it like had a, it has a clear cover, double space, 25 lines. And it just, it had, or it's, for instance, if you were to pick up a, if you were in a play in high school and you picked up the script, that's what it looks like. And Diane, talk a little bit, and again, this is setting the table. We wanna make sure that people, you know, understand what the job entails. You're listening intently to everything. Your focus has to be 100%. This is a precision job, truth matters. What are you doing in, in terms of your senses when you're in the courtroom? Just listening and hoping to God I can get it. I mean, after 30 years, I'm still like, oh my God, like I get it. But I'll tell you, it, I have some hairy moments in there still to this day. I'm like, yes. I don't get really nervous because this, I think I've been through every bad thing that can happen and every wrong thing I've had through, I've had machines break in the middle of like unbelievable testimony. You know, I've seen fist fights in the middle of the courtroom. Um, people that drop on the floor and have to, we have to get the, you know, EMS to get them out because their kid was just sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and the mother collapse. I mean, I've seen everything that could happen. But you also have to be aware of, of things like head nods and shoulders shrugging and things like grunts. I mean, and all the things that you, you, we take for granted as we're listening, but you're sort of recording these things with your fingers, aren't you? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Sure. U-H dash H-U-M or H-U-H, uh-huh. You know what? You're gonna pray that you have a judge that says, was that a yes? But you know, even they don't get it every time. The judge will miss one. And I'm like, I had to put the uh-huh. But um, I had a judge, I just transcribed something yesterday. You know what she said through the entire 300 pages? All righty, all righty, all righty. And I mean, I'm not making fun of her. She's lovely and she's professional in every way, but she didn't realize she was saying, all righty. How do you put in all righty? 
it is it's for writing, I can't fix it because yeah. you said all righty. It, it's 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 funny if any one of us were to see a transcript of what we said in a conversation, we would be shocked. <laughs> Myself because included, Jordan. I'm not exempt from it. Now, in terms of the courthouse and the courtroom, uh, let's tell everybody what system, quote unquote, you work in and the venues itself. Where do you work? Well, naturally, it's Massachusetts. And I predominantly have done superior court. And there's, a, there's all kinds of court. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's bankruptcy court, juvenile court, district court. We have the Boston Municipal Court in Boston. Um, we have the federal court across the, the city over on the waterfront. But I did mostly superior court. What does superior court handle? They do civil and criminal trials, but they do, I think that it's, it used to be, and I'm not sure what it is today, but your case on the civil side had to be uh, I meet a threshold of, I think, $10,000 to get into that court. If it was less than that, you had to go to district. I don't know what it is today. But then another thing on the criminal side, it has to be like a big deal. We deal with murder, mayhem, rape, armed robbery, really bad stuff, real bad stuff. We're going to talk about some specific cases that everyone in this room, in this virtual room, will will remember for sure. Because crimes that are dramatic and violent uh, tend to stay with us, the trauma of those. But let's just uh, finish on the courtroom. You know, a lot of people think that uh, lawyers get up like Sam Waterston in uh, Law and & Order and walk all over the room and put their elbows on the jury bench and, you know, have free reign. Is that true? No, that's just for, that's for Hollywood. That's Jordan. You know, I went to court reporting school and when I got into the courtroom on day one, I realized I knew less than nothing and I was ill prepared at all because I found myself, the, the court is its own little world and it's like a city within itself. And I had no idea what was going on. Things were flying over my head. There were words I had never heard of. And everything happened so fast, like boom, boom. I was like, my head was spinning. I'm like, what is this place? But um, one thing that shocked me, a lot of Latin terms are used and they're used every day in court. And that fre freaked me out at first. I'm like, what the heck is this? Like Latin is still alive and well there, um, which is kind of nice. They have a lot of nice traditions in court, Jordan, really, that are still there. Formalities. What about the opening of a court session? You, you told me about that. The oh, they call it the cry when they call the court to, to order. You know the court officer? In Massachusetts, we call them court officers. They look like police officers. In other states, they call them like bailiffs. But in Massachusetts, they're court officers. And they call the court to order. And they'll stand up and they'll say, all rise. And everyone stands up. And the judge takes the bench and they say, Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons have anything to do before the honorable, honorable justice, you know, they'll say the name, Smith. Um, now sitting in and for the county of Suffolk, draw near, give your attendance, and you shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and this honorable court. Court is open, you may be seated. That's how every day starts. Yeah, it's very much based on the British system, obviously, uh, of, of law and it's very formal and it's kind of nice to know that that tradition exists and one more question about the structure of the court we'll probably get to more the judge's role and the judge's style can vary a little bit but how strict are these judges most of them oh they're strict but they're not unreasonable i mean you know they're they're there to uphold the law they're like an umpire they call the balls and the strikes. You know, they have they have an enormous amount of power. But, you know, on the other hand, Jordan, they don't have an enormous amount of power, power. In, in the sense that when a, when a verdict comes back, they have to sentence on the what the jury said. It's like sometimes you'll hear people say, why didn't that judge give them life? You know what? But they can't because the jury came back with a lesser, you know, you know what I mean? They have to go by, uh, there's a lot of things that their hands are tied. Yeah, yeah. You know, so well, one I fun think, oh, sorry. No, I was just, I was going to ask, you know, the fun question. You know what that one is. I got two fun ones. But, well, uh, <laughs> well, we all like fun. What? <laughs> well, the one of them is how many of them use the gavel regularly? 
Zero? Never. And, you know, I feel like I got ripped off. I worked there 30 years and I've never seen them go, you know, you're sentenced to 15 years in jail. Oh, goodness gracious. Someone's That's one calling. of the judges calling. He wants his gavel phone, back. Jo you know that phone never rings? Okay. She's, while she's doing that, isn't that fascinating, that folks, that there's no gavel? I mean, one of the judges, Diane said, has a an honorary big sort of a play toy gavel that he uses, like right? Like three and a half feet long. It's like this a yardstick. As a shtick, but it's not true. The other question is always people want to know what they're wearing under those robes. Oh, they well, actually, they dress beautifully. Although I noticed that the, the men keep their suit jacket in the lobby. They don't, I guess it must get too hot, you know? Lobby, not the lobby where we all hang out and get a candy bar, not that lobby. Well, that's just a word for their, their, um, their chamber, you can call it the cha judges' chambers, lobby. It's just an office. That's all it is. Just but you make know, that point. Jordan, they don't wear wigs. Like you know, when British they wear wig, like in the British wear wigs. Yes. They don't wear wigs, and they they wear the black robe with the big. I call them bat wings. You know, when they put their arm up, it looks like <laughs> they're like bats. Yes. And you know what? Those bat wings are the bane of my existence because they inadvertently hit my microphone. And when I'm taking testimony, this is what I hear from those bat wings. <laughs> like it muffles what is being said with those, those bat wings. Court reporters, like we talk about it, like those darn bat wings. When they move <laughs> their arms, we can't hear what they're saying. Well, you know one what? Of the things, what, one of the things that, that we've done, Diane, is talk about behind the scenes stuff. So if you're listening to this tonight and you wanna know more really cool, funny stories, Check out the podcast, All Rise with Diane Godfrey. It's it's really fun. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you going to say something else about the bat wings? Or? Who knows what I was going to... Oh, you know what I was going to say? Sometimes judges, like they, they're in these big chairs, these big leather chairs, and they're on wheels. So they're talking and they go back, and all of a sudden they're back here, and you can't hear them. They're talking up to the... It's like, where did you go? Would you come back? You can't say anything to them. And then the best is when they start to unwrap a candy, like a lozenger, and it's going... Oh it's like, gosh. they don't realize, like, I don't know. But well, we have all these extraneous noises in the court. Like, we had... God love him, he's dead now. But we had one um, clerk, courtroom clerk. He learned to evidently type with one finger. And he'd, would we be taking testimony, he would be on his computer going like this. Like, and the whole thing, like he'd be, it was so loud. It, he'd be going, I think it's the hunt and peck system. And it's like, he's really got to, you know, stop doing that. I mean, little things like that can just throw you off. Well, let's get into some of the things, the topics that we cover. And many of them involve some pretty famous celebratory cases, not in a good way, but cases that you've worked and that you know of. Um, and, and I guess I'd like to start with the first case that we talked about on one of the very first podcasts. It was a murder, not a famous quote unquote murder, but a murder that was so unnecessary as most of them are and so tragic. The older lady who rented up her Oh yeah. Uh, her, that, space. her name was Hilda DiVincenzo. And you know, Jordan, if I had a nickel for every murder that I did, that there's two people on the back of the bench, it never makes the news. It's just like, you know, the son and like the daughter-in-law are sitting there. And it's the saddest thing. Like people will get shot to death and like, it's just comes and goes. And, you know, a lot of the murders you see on TV, but for every murder you see covered on TV, we have... You know, in Suffolk County, pre-COVID, we'd have like three murders going at a time, all the time in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes four murders. I mean, all the time. And Suffolk County comprises Boston, Winthrop, Revere, and Chelsea, those four cities. So that's not counting all the other big cities in Massachusetts and the, the Low Lawrence area, the Cape. I mean, there's murders, unfortunately, everywhere, mayhem. Now, this woman uh, was a sweet, kindly older lady um, and she, what, uh, decided to rent out one of her rooms or one of her floors? Well, if you're familiar with the area, and can I just put on a side here, people always ask me, like, where are you from? They always just want to know, curiously, and I'll just tell you, born and brought up in Walpole, Mass., lived in Norwood for a long time. I live in Dedham now, but I lived in Revere, and I lived in downtown Boston for a long time. So I've been all around greater Boston. 
but um, just so you know, that's who I am. But what did you ask me? I about, the, about the first murder case we covered. Oh, if you know the area up on the Revere Everett line, and it's called Prattville. It's a really nice section of Everett, really nice. And that's where this murder happened. And if you know Newbridge Cafe, it was the triple decker right across from Newbridge Cafe. And that's famous for the lamb tips and the, you know, the homemade ginger ale and the homemade, that's like the neatest place to go, by the way. It's like, oh my God, it's delicious. We also anyway, do restaurant that, reviews in case you're wondering. That's, that's where, well, if there's a carbohydrate, I know where to find it, but doesn't, doesn't my double chin know it? But I'll just tell you, Jordan, that's where it happened. She owned a triple decker smack across the street from Newbridge Cafe. She lived on the second floor. Her husband died for many years. The first floor and the third floor were vacant. And she decided she wanted to rent them out. She put an ad on Craigslist. She was the person who vetted these people. And she was such a lovely woman. And I think she was older and she was in her eighties. And unfortunately she was very trusting and she rented both apartments. And the long and short of it is the people she rented to on the third floor within days, the guy had murdered her in her own apartment within days of living mm -hmm. there. And, and then he set the, the place on fire. Yeah. That was like the best, he, he, he set it on fire. And one one of the things that that we've learned that I've learned in working with Diane folks, and I'll have you comment, is the fact that you know so many of these crimes are so unnecessary, obviously, but the criminals are so, let's put it bluntly, stupid, <laughs> that the idea of them getting away with it is is unlikely in any scenario. So again, I mean, they they do these things. Some of these people do these things, and then they're caught pretty quickly, and then it has to go through the process. Well, he even took a lot of her jewelry and hawked it in Everett at a pawn shop. I mean, hello. I mean, he gave his real name when he did it. And then so when, when the police went into his apartment, they found her wedding ring under, he was in his bed. He stood up from the bed, they picked up the pillow and her wedding ring was under the pillow. He said he found it outside in the yard in a bag. Now know. that that was one of the first cases. We've done some celebrated ones we'll get to. Um, how many people uh, listening, and you, obviously like, we can't see you, but just think yeah. about this. If I yeah. say the word Aruda, the name Aruda, and that might spark a memory because it was one of the most brutal cases involving a young girl, a young child. Share with us what we talked about on that podcast because that's a nutty that, case. That still upsets me to this day. That was in 1978, September of 78. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Lou Arruda, it was like the third day of school, the first week of school down um, in Raynham, Massachusetts, where she lived, took the school bus to a friend's house to retrieve her 10 speed bike. She was taking her bike home in broad daylight, mind you. And James Cater grabbed her on a stretch of road that was a little bit secluded and mm -hmm. threw her in the car and brought her to Freetown State Forest, tied her to a tree and killed her. He left her there, killed her. And, and Diane, share with us, if you would, the fact that it wasn't one trial, it wasn't two, it was several trials and the, the four, and you worked part of that system for, you worked the, right. I worked the fourth trial. Okay, yeah. why were there four trials? Because it's the United States of America and you have more fights at the apple before you're finally convicted. I mean, he, well, I think to be honest with you, one of them was a hung jury. One of them was an error of law. The appellate court found it was an error of law. I forget the third reason, but it, he had four go rounds before it was finally, he died in prison. Recently, but, right. And he, yeah, and he, he contended till his death that he didn't kill her, but, 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 there's always a but, right? He, years before that had abducted a girl up in Boxford, Mass in broad daylight, same thing. She had a bike walking, grabbed her. And she ended up coming to the Mary Lou Arruda trial years later and testifying. And she stood up and she put her head down like this. I'll never forget it. She had blonde hair and she opened up her, her hair 
and she showed a, a scar like this where he had hit her over the head with a tire iron and split her head open. But Left she was dead. feisty. He grabbed the wrong girl. She lived. Mm -hmm. She fought. And um, he brought her into the woods textbook of what he did to Mary Lou Arruda. And, and this would be a good time to mention that you're 10 feet away in some cases from somebody, in this case, James Cater, who was an absolute demon. There's no, no, nothing to say but evil in this human being. And at times they can look like our next door neighbors, right? I mean, but at other times there can be that steely glance that you just happen to catch and it puts a shiver up your spine, I guess. Well, I couldn't help it, but I, at one point I looked him in the eye. I had to. And I just kind of looked and he locked eyes with me and he's like, we had a stare down and he won. I, I looked away. I'm telling you, Jordan, it was the scariest I've ever, ever, I was just like so freaked out. I'm thinking, wow, you know, but that Aruda family were the nicest people ever. And I cannot believe that such a horrible thing happened. You know what makes it worse, Jordan? The testimony in that trial, the mother saw that car go by her house because it was, I mean, he was abducting her, but he was in this screaming like mint julep color green car with a distinctive black racing stripe on it. It stuck out like a sore thumb. And the mother remembers seeing that car going by and her daughter was in it. I mean, it's just cruel. It's beyond the pale. Now, when we, we talk about famous crimes, Massachusetts is not a stranger to famous incidents. I mean, you look down through history from, you know, the Sacco and Vanzetti being tried for sedition and executed. You've got uh, the Albert DeSalvo alleged Boston Strangler, but one case that, that you're very familiar with, and we had somebody on the show who covered it, uh, was the case of the doctor in Wellesley, the Grenadier. allergist. Grenadier. Gren Grenadier. Let's, Grenadier. Let's share with the audience a little bit of background and, and your sense as to what was happening there in that case. Now, I was in the courthouse working, but I did not have anything to do with that case. I didn't work on it, but I, big, I, I distinctly remember it happening. I mean, it was a big case. And um, his children, you know, stood by him. They were in the back of the courtroom. And to this day, I guess, contend that he was incapable of ki killing his wife. But that was a, it was a Sunday morning. I think it was Halloween morning. And it was in Wellesley, Mass. They went out for a walk and they had their dogs with them. And he alleged that they split up. And then when he found her in the woods, she was dead. But I think his plan got foiled because somebody saw him running out of the woods. You know, it just it, it did it didn't add up. He he got bagged, is what he did. He Real so sociopath. You told me that you know, and and because we talked with the court report uh, officer, who we was had the, the one court who, officer on who who presided on yeah, who worked. He, he was really descriptive about how how almost dead psychotic. the eyes were in this guy. So Psych yeah, psychotic, and 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 yeah, and and as it's going along, he's just standing there or sitting there unfazed it seems jordan that you know what that reminds me of i've never talked to you about this i did a case the guy's name was let me think it was an asian name anyway he killed his wife his wife wanted a divorce so he said can you come over we'll talk about the divorce she came over with the two kids he had her put the kids next door in either a neighbor or a sister's house, and then he killed her. And I mean, killed her, grabbed, mutilated her. He even let, the way he positioned her, so when they found her, she was looking up as if to say hello to whoever came in to find her mm -hmm. body. And he left like the screwdriver on her belly and I'm, or the, or the um, vice grips that he, I, I won't even tell you what, it'll make you upset if I tell you how he mutilated her, but um, what he, fled the country and years later they were looking for him for murder years later he must have thought the coast was clear because he came back in through san francisco back into the u.s and they nabbed him when he came into the country and they brought him back to boston because it happened in alston on cambridge street so they tried him and i was the court reporter i never thought about that for years this case and um they tried him and I'm not kidding you, that trial went on for like 14 days. This is how he was for 14 days for like six and a half hours a day. 
completely stone faced. Right? He didn't look left. He didn't look right. He didn't look up. He didn't move. He just was like a statue. And when they convicted him, same thing, just like this. When they sentenced him, he didn't move a muscle. He didn't barely even blink. I couldn't, it was, it was crazy. Right. Um, as you're talking, the, the, the players in the courtroom, uh, obviously the judge and you, and obviously counsel and uh, DAs and so forth. How many people generally are there? In the movies, we always see a, a lawyer, a lead lawyer and an assistant or a partner. But is it is it generally one to one or? What do you mean? The people, the court staff? Yeah, the people the on, the in the midst of the trial. For instance, uh, that particular case, how many lawyers were in attendance? You mean on Darling? I remember his name, Darling Wan. That was it, Darling Wan. But um, well, usually, to tell you the truth, um, Jordan, when you have a criminal trial, there's not that many lawyers. Unless it's like Aaron Hernandez, there's a whole fleet of them because we had him in our court. But when you're on the civil side, you have an army of lawyers. And we have two business litigation sessions in Boston. I love them because they're fascinating. And they have the top lawyers from everywhere fly in. And it's really something to say, you know, some of these civil law, uh, law, law firms in town, they have like a whole hierarchy of people. Like someone gets the food, someone does the photocopying, someone drives the van, someone, it's unbelievable. And like, I think to myself, if I were a sole practitioner, it's like unbelievable. Like one person versus like this huge moneyed firm. It's like, Boy, they're getting a big cut if they win the case. That's, <laughs> that's Jordan, certainly I'll tell you something. The issues of law are fascinating in business litigation. Fascinating. And Diane, even the legal arguments are a joy to listen to. And they're all public venues. Anyone that's retired yeah. or has a day off, you are, people have this misconception. The court is a public, it's like the public library. You, everybody is welcome. Anyone can go in any courtroom with very few exceptions. We have a few exceptions once in a while, but it's for the most part, anyone that's listening to this has as much right in that courtroom as the judge. Yeah, you were saying uh, about the staff and the time. The reason trials take so long and sometimes they go on for a great deal longer than a week uh, is because of all the research and all the backup, right? And, and he, in a murder case, there are everything from forensics to police testimony to uh, lab work. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty extensive process, isn't it? Well, you know, when I first, I remember a long time ago, I remember Judge Patrick King, he's now retired. I worked with him in civil and he showed me, he said, come on, he taught me a lot of things. And he was just wonderful. He said, look at this. And there were two books up on his bench. They look, the only way I can tell lay people, they look like cookbooks. And they are all written out. There's a civil and a criminal one. And anyone that's practicing law has to open the book and see what they wanna do and follow the rules. It's like making a cake or a recipe. You can't skip a rule and you can't go to the next step unless you do that step. And there's a lot of them are time standards. In so many days, you have to produce this. In so many days, you have to counter this. And so he showed me that and I never forgot it. And that's what takes so long, you know? Like if you and I were lawyers, we're adversaries, it takes long because I would have to like fill out answers to inter interrogatories and send them to you. And then you have so many days to gather your information. Think of on the criminal side, Jordan, you have to get a permission from a judge to go swab the inside of someone's cheek for DNA. It's half the time you have to track the person down. Then you have to swab them. Then you have to send it to the lab. Then they have to write a report. Then it goes to the police. Then the DA gets it. It takes time to prepare cases. You have to find the witnesses. Half the time they flee out of state. You have to make arrangements to go down and talk to them or you have to flow, have them flown up. It cost a fortune. That same judge once told me what it cost to run a courtroom per day. I forget what he told me, but it was staggering. The amount of tax money it takes to put a case, think about all the people. They're paying me to take the testimony. They're paying me to prepare a transcript. They're putting, they're putting witnesses up in hotels because they're from North Carolina now. Um, 
you have forensic people, you have to run, it's, it's endless, it's endless. Interesting point uh, at, in our discussion here, folks, uh, for anybody who's ever been on jury duty and had a trial that you had to participate in, you realize if you're a working person, as most of us are, you are going to have to give up your job and perhaps lose income. And it's not like the state of Massachusetts is really helping you out. What do they pay now on average? What do you mean for it to be a juror? You're right. It's appalling. It's $50 a day. I don't know whose fault it is, but let me tell you something. I went to that court in 1991. In 1991, the juror pay was $50 a day. My transcripts were statutorily set at $4 a page for civil and $3 for criminal. That, that they, they set those rates in 1988. In 2022, we haven't had a five, even a five cent rage, rate raise. So there you go. But you know, by contrast, Jordan, my sister in the past, I don't know, eight, seven or eight months ago, she was on a trial, a murder trial in Arizona. And she told me that they had, um, if you, depending on where you were in your life, if you were a full-time employee, state of Arizona paid you for your daily wage of a, you'd, for showing up every day for jury service, $350. Why is Massachusetts? That, that's your bus fare right there and your cup <laughs> of coffee, right? 20 yeah. bucks. I mean, Parking anyway. Bucks. Well, let's, let's get back to a few other cases and the, couple of things that we do on the podcast. We've had authors on and journalists who have covered cases. Uh, I mean, Diane has worked gazillion cases, but not everyone is one that she's covered. So we've brought experts in. We'll talk about one of the great uh, trial attorneys who's a guest recently, but the Charles Stewart case, everyone from here should be familiar with that, that horrific event. And we had a, a terrific author on who no uh, covered that. Joe Sharkey. He was a columnist for the uh, business travel columnist for Wall, not Wall Street Journal, for the New York Times. And he started years ago prior to that um, as a criminal um, reporter in Philly. And how he wound up doing that, he still doesn't understand how he got that gig. He's like, what do I know about, remember who said that? What do I know about business travel? But anyway, he wrote like seven true crime books, one of which was one about Chuck Stewart, the infamous, you know, jumping off the Tobin Bridge and such. Yeah, and and we learned a lot of things that we didn't really know. Um, but it really was an an incredible mess, and the media was involved, and and uh, how he was able to control the the news flow was incredible over that period. Um, but that was that was a case that if you listen to the podcast, you'll get a lot more. We don't want to go into detail now, but. Uh, Another example of the guests that we have, I just teased it a second ago, is um, a fellow by the name of Jay Carney. That name may be familiar to people. You would certainly recognize him on TV. He's probably one of the nation's top criminal defense attorneys, isn't he, Diane? Yeah, he's up there. And but what what he, what did what did he talk about? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. I just can say you. He talked about a lot of things. We'll get into some of his famous clients, but you were going to say something about what everybody thinks? Well, everybody thinks he's a big deal except for him. He doesn't think he's a big deal. He's the most humble, regular guy ever. Yeah. But he, he uh, remember like in the early 90s, they shot up a couple of, in Boston and Brookline, I think, um, the abortion clinics. He was the um, lawyer for that. The, you know, the guy, what was his name? Salvi? I believe so. Remember that sympathizer in Sudbury, the, the Al-Qaeda guy? Yes. He, he represented him. But the most celebrated case, he was Whitey Bulger's attorney. Was he attorney by choice or appointed to Whitey? <laughs> well, both, I think. He was appointed and he ended up rising to the occasion. Let's tell the story because it's 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 scary but funny at the same time. Well, about... You tell it the best. Okay, all right. So we have Jay in the studio. Uh, we I have a production studio in Braintree, Mass. And Jay was kind enough to come in. What a gentleman, real class wow. act. And uh, his job is to defend people. That's his, his constitutional responsibility. So he was chosen as a public defender 
to defend Whitey Bulger. Why? Because Whitey Bulger's assets were, were taken by the US government when he was captured, at least the assets they could find. So Jay Carney, if, if, if you know him from TV, is a good looking man with a white beard, a little bit like whiter than mine, I'm happy to say, and very little hair on top and glasses. So he tells the story of meeting with Whitey Bulger for the first time in the court back room or whatever. And uh, he's looking at Whitey Bulger and realizes he's looking in at a mirror image of himself. Whitey Bulger looked exactly like Jay Carney. And how do we know that? Because Jay held up a picture of Whitey Bulger next to his face and it's the same face. I mean, it's scary that that, that was the case. And, and what Carney said to us was, he was a little worried, actually for a few minutes worried that Whitey, who was in his late seventies or whatever at the time, Whitey would conk him over the head, put his suit on, take his briefcase and walk out of the court. <laughs> it's that crazy, but that's how close he looked like. Oh yeah. And, and, but but Diane, would you share with our wonderful Needham friends uh, what he talked about in terms of Whitey Bulger's um, demeanor and what his role was, what why he took the case? Well, he had he as a, he looked at it strictly as a defense criminal defense lawyer would, and it's you know the way that our system is innocent until proven guilty, and people lose sight of that, you know. And and he was innocent until proven guilty. You don't want to jump the gun, but everyone in, in the way the Constitution is written, everyone is, you know, given the right to representation. And think it goes far as far back as John Adams. He wasn't popular when he decided that he was gonna, you know, defend the the Redcoats. Yeah, the Boston right? Massacre. Yeah, yeah. So, but what it, it wasn't uh, one of the things that Jay did was cr uh, take letters from the girlfriend <gasps> to Whitey yes. and vice versa. Yes, wasn't that unbelievable? What was her name, Catherine? I forget her last name. The girl. Yeah, she, she's out of jail now, I believe. I yeah, she, she was found in the apartment in Santa Monica with him. Wasn't it Santa Monica, California? Yeah, something like that. But this this was this was as close as anybody ever got to Whitey Bulger beyond the gang people that he hung around with. And he was intimate with him, intimate in meaning he would take messages back and forth. So um Yeah, she would write a letter and he'd take it. Catherine would write a letter to Whitey and and Jay Carney would deliver it to Whitey and then Whitey would write back and Jay would take that letter and give it and it went back and forth and back and forth and it was just amazing and we all know that uh, uh, Whitey Bulger was I guess convicted of mass murder and, and all kinds of mayhem um, but he was murdered in prison and when we asked Jay what he thought he thought what the rest of us thought <laughs> A little too convenient, right? Yeah. You know, you have to listen to the podcast. It's fascinating. That is a particularly great episode. You know, one of the things that we, I credit Diane with doing is, is broadening and she picks the topics. I'm just there to help produce it. You, you wanted to go after people who have been wrongly accused and convicted in some cases of crimes. Right. So you looked at the Justice Project and Innocence tell the, Project. Yeah. the Innocence Project, sorry, and tell our friends. Um, the guest that we had, who was very entertaining as well. Shorty. His name was Shorty. That was his nickname, remember? Yep. He was on death row in Florida for what, nine years or 13 years? And he was exonerated in the end by the Innocence Project. The poor kid never committed murder. Far from it. He was just in the wrong place, wrong time, acted not proper. Like he put, he, he came upon the murder scene and he touched the weapon because he heard something and thought he was going to get killed. He heard something in the other room of the house and it turned out to be the dog. So then he dropped the murder weapon. I mean, his hands were, the whole thing was just a comedy of errors, but the poor kid got nailed for it. And it's sad, but. Well, just to set the tone too, I mean, he knew the, these were neighbors and, and right. he knew them. And it turns out as it is often the case that it was a family issue, I guess yes. the daughter killed the mother. Is that what happened? And the grandmother, the wheelchair-bound oh, yeah. grandmother. And you know what? 
years later, they had the evidence still stored away somewhere. They took the evidence and they did all the swabbings and they exonerated him. It couldn't have been him. It, the and, and that's blood was mixed with the mother's blood, not his blood. I mean, it was crazy. Right, right. That's where the science and the DNA testing is so critical because we've actually found people innocent, not not guilty at all. But before that kind of testing happened, they uh, they had no choice. Let's talk about one more case, and then uh, looking at my watch here, we we certainly would love to open it up to questions. And that's the Sean Ellis case. Sean Ellis, and you might have read about this in the. Uh, well, there's <laughs> there's Jay Carney in the corner as my screen. Thank Please you, Thomas. Up. Thomas put a picture of Jay Carney up. Oh, Thanks, Tom. Oh, great. Well done. If you can find a Whitey Bulger picture, that would be great too, because you're what about, obviously- Yeah, but later in life. Like yeah, the, the, the arrested Whitey. Uh, Sean Ellis case, this involved, uh, and, and we don't ever besmirch police because they do an amazing job, but there are occasionally some bad apples. And this involved a young black man who was framed and uh, another egregious case. But who do we have on who talked about that? Rosemary Scapaccio. She's a Scapiccio. She's a well-known criminal defense lawyer in Boston. And she actually, if you're interested in that case, there was like a six or seven part series on Netflix. And it's, there were a few bad apples in the Boston police department. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here for one minute and start dissing police because I have the utmost respect for them. What would we do without our, our police officers? Although injustice just makes my skin crawl. And there are a few bad apples and they have to be weeded out. So what happened in this case briefly and then we'll go to some questions. That poor kid. Well, th there was a, a um, over, there was a detective, his name was Mullen, what was it Mullen? No, Mulligan. Mulligan. He was asleep in like a Rosendale, like a Walgreens doing an overnight detail. He was asleep in his vehicle. Someone came up upon him and just killed him. And Sean Ellis had been in the parking lot. He said he was buying diapers or something. And he was with two other girls and they, the cops framed him like they needed somebody and they just put him. They didn't even give him a chance. They went to his girlfriend and they said that they were going to put her in jail and they made her testify and she knew she was lying. The whole thing was a disgrace. It was a disgrace. But Rosemary, thank God, prevailed. She went over so many hurdles and she finally got him, you know, what he deserved, which was his freedom. But uh, it, it's hard to even imagine what it's like to lose your freedom and to be on, on death watch for 10 years or whatever. How do you, re money doesn't make that come go away. I mean, you can pay somebody restitution, but it's it's one of the great injustices. Uh, much much like anyone getting away with something is an injustice. One more thing, um, I said one more thing a while ago, but I wanna, I wanna- That's okay. I wanna end with the, the fun story. You know what I'm gonna end with, what? but the victims and you you tell a story and this this really gets to the heart of what it's all about to be a victim about the father and son you meet in the lobby after a murder case. Oh, yeah, I forgot. that was a murder case that I did. If you can believe this, there was a murder in broad daylight, a shooting, and it was a gun for hire. Like somebody said to somebody, if you kill this person, this guy, this young man, I'm gonna give you $10,000 cash. Okay, so the guy wants 10,000 and he goes, behind Northeastern <laughs> University, there was like a condo complex or an apartment complex and brought like 1130 in the morning, the kid gets out of his car and he gets shot to death. But there was one problem with that. He had the wrong kid. It was just an unrelated, wrong place, wrong time. The shooter got mixed up and killed somebody that was completely innocent. So they caught him and the case went to trial. And after the sentencing, I exited the courtroom and I, like I do every day, I just blend into the crowd and I, hit the elevator to go back to my office and the father of the victim approached me and he put his hand out and he said I want to thank you and you know Jordan honestly not woe was me but no one ever notices me I'm, I'm like a potted plant in there I have no role I'm just silently I'm a silent scribe so I couldn't believe he came up to me and he's like I want to thank you and I'm like for what he said for working on my son's case I said you know my pleasure I mean my god then he said, I want you to meet my son. And he introduced me to a lovely young man. He was in his early 20s. And he said, 
This is my only son I have left. I had three. This is one. We just sentenced, you just sentenced the killer of my second son. And a few years ago, I lost another son to gun violence. I was stunned. What do you say to that? I tell you, I was so shaken up from, shooken up, shaken up. I went back to my office. I was just like, like I got hit with like a two by four. That stayed with me for so long. And he was the most gracious, kind, nice man. I'm telling you, Jordan, it knocked the tar out of me. Let's end our official presentation though with something a little more fun. And <laughs> there are occasionally uh, in any courtroom in America, but in Boston, certainly uh, celebrities who stop by to either be a witness or to testify or just to be in the in the in the gallery but when when god on earth comes by on a particular day you, <laughs> I never god on earth in the form of one tom brady yep what happened that day quarterback tom brady of the new england patriots if anyone's listening that's not from new england but um this was in 2007 there was a civil case and it was Charlie Weiss. He had, what was his affiliation with the Pats? Uh, he was an, uh, the offensive coach, one of the coaches on the team. Well, I guess he had had the bypass surgery down at yeah. Mass General and somehow it went awry. I mean, he lived in everything, but he was suing the doctors. So I still never understood why, and it was none of my business, but he had Tom Brady as a witness. So Tom right. Brady shows up to the courthouse to, <laughs> now, honest to God, you would have thought Jesus Christ himself had laid. I'm not kidding. I've never seen, the only time I've ever seen commotion like that, I, when I was 18, I was in the pres presence of Jackie Kennedy, Onassis, you know, and I'd never seen such a commotion that day. That was at the Kennedy School over in Cambridge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this rivaled it. So he came and men that I worked with for years that never even like cracked a smile, they turned into putty. I've never seen anything like it. They turned into seven-year-olds. <laughs> it was like, they would all, and you know what? The court officers were trying to control it. Nobody cared. They were poking at him. Like, I've never seen anything like it. Well, anyway, it got so crazy that the court officers made a decision that they needed to put him in an undisclosed location and lock him in there alone. My right hand to God, Jordan, they picked an empty, office adjacent to my office that had a side door that connected so they put him in there and they had two court offices standing guard out front but I had a side door and I was at my desk and I said Tom Brady is alone in that next room should I open the door should I not open the door I was scared I was like should I you know was he going to be a jerk am I going to get in trouble I opened the door and I, I said, Diane, be brave. When are you ever gonna see Tom Brady again? So I opened the door and I went in and he was leaning against one of the desks. I'll never forget it. He had his feet crossed and he had his arms crossed and he had on a suit and, but his shirt, he had a white shirt on, had no tie. And he had it like unbuttoned, like three buttons. Oh. <laughs> That's what really caught my eye. I'd never seen anyone back then, never not wearing a tie like that. And I'm like, what the heck is that? He was, Oh, when I tell you this, you won't believe me, but I'm going to tell you. He was shy. He was actually shy. But I'll tell you something, the manners on him. I had a lovely conversation with him. He asked me what I did. I told him he was generally interested in my job. I told him from soup to nuts what I did. He asked me intelligent questions. He was fascinated by the whole thing. Then I see out of the corner of my eye, one of our clerks from way upstairs come down. He had no business on a civil floor. He hadn't been down there in years. He came down <laughs> and he had something like a football. He's like, will you please stop? He turned into like, he was like eight years old. It was hilarious. And then they took him away. He went on the um, witness stand for probably seven or eight minutes and was gone. But I've never seen, next day it was on the front of the Herald. I remember. And, was, and, and uh, you know, you, you got as close to him as Giselle. So you got something to crow about you know what he was handsome and you Still know, is. you know yeah but you know i said to myself this is like the kind of guy that every mother wants their daughter to marry and like everyone wants their kid to be like he he he's just a good role model you know 
it's just well, it's, a nice, it, it's a nice story and we we tell it a lot because it is fun and it shows that I love the fact that these guys, these old grizzled court guys turned into putty. I love that line that you said. Jordan, you can't believe their behavior. It was embarrassing. I was laughing so hard. I was like, I've never seen, these people have got to get a hold of themselves. They were like fools. They were like grown men turned into fools. It was unbelievable. It's a lot with grown men, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, at this point, uh, we would love to take any questions that people might have about any particular aspect of the court experience or particular cases that Diane might know about, or we can just comment in general. Uh, you do have a chat feature, I believe, on your uh, Zoom platform. Let me just go down and see that. Yeah, so if you click the chat uh, icon, you can type something in. It just might be easier than opening it up. So if anyone has any specific questions, we'll gladly take them, give you guys a few minutes to uh, write anything you'd like to write. Um, one of the things that it's fun about doing a podcast and Diana's learning this, you never know who's going to hear it and who's going to pick it up. So we're getting nice feedback, as you say, from all over the world. And uh, as this grows, there, you are going to see more coverage of Diane. She's going to be a superstar in this realm. And I keep telling her that. And she keeps poo-pooing me and I'm saying no, because she's got a great personality. Okay. Any stories about the Boston Marathon bombing case? Diane, were you involved in that at all? Absolutely not, and I'll tell you why. That is a federal case. I'm on the state level. The state has absolutely nothing to do with the federal court at all. That was all feds. That's the beautiful Moakley Courthouse over on the waterfront near the Barking Crab. And Jordan, can I tell you something? I did get to, um, I did get to work there one time. The federal, they needed a volunteer and I volunteered because we had an odd case. It was a hybrid case. It was half state and half federal. That never happens. So I went over there and I worked there and I marveled because it was so civil over there. Like you could walk through the hallway and it was nice and quiet. Like when, when I work in Superior Court, there were like families like sitting on benches, eating McDonald's. The kids are crawling on the floor. Like everyone's like fighting and yelling and it was just so different. It was just so different in federal court. Here's a question that I've asked you about, and it's it might be a little tricky to explain, but uh, what you is what you're doing in a in a sense stenography, and then are you transcribing it? How does the actual type work? Okay, I I started and I went to school for steno, that funny weird machine, and many of my colleagues, many of us started on steno, and as we got older. And the shoulder started to give out, the carpal tunnel came. We went over to what's called voice writing. I still know steno, I can transcribe it, I can read it, I can do it. But I do what's called voice writing and I have for a long time now. And what I do is I talk into a machine and I will verbatim say, I'll identify the speaker and what's happening. Like I'll say, um, direct examination now begins by Attorney Smith of Miss Ann Jones. Q, what is your name? A, Ann Jones. Q, where do you live? A, you know, document is handed to witness. Um, exhibit one is marked. It's a map of Seaver Street. You know, like it just goes on. Then I say, you know, Vanari entered, beginning of individual voir dire. You know, you just, you just keep saying everything that's happening. And then so I go, you, oh, go ahead. Do you say that as it's happening or? No, you're, you're Oh yeah, in it. real time, in real time. Real time, okay. Oh yeah, I'm talking into a machine, making a record of it with my voice. Ah, uh -huh. but you're doing it very quietly. Yeah, I have like what's called, um, I forget what they call it. I have like a thing, it's a special thing I bought. So it'll, cause I have a loud voice, but I mean, oh, I do. Hadn't noticed. I mean, <laughs> but, but um, it muffles, I don't know what it's called. It has a word, but I can't think of it right now. Well, it's very interesting though. Thank you for explaining that. And that, another question from Catherine, you mentioned the James Cater case, locking eyes with the defendant, scary. Were there any other cases where you felt scared or creeped out by a defendant? No, you wanna know the truth? I've had, over the years, I've had a lot of conversations with murdered murderers like in the courtroom. like. It depends on the courtroom. If it's an old courtroom and they're small court, court, they come in for like a hearing. They've been in jail like 35 years and they're older now. When they're not drugged out and they're not, you know, drunk and, you know, they come in, 
I think they're human beings are complicated. They they one day they committed a murder, but they all they still have personality. They have feelings. They, you know, a lot of them aren't stupid either. I mean, I've talked to them, and um, I don't really get scared. And I'll tell you why. They come in in shackles, and they come in in um, you know handcuffs. But the court officers are so well um, versed. I'm not, I'm not scared because they're in control and they're, they're really well trained. And a lot of them have been on the front lines of like Iraq and Afghanistan. So that courtroom isn't gonna like jar them at all. You know, and even yeah, the female pretty... ones, the female yeah. ones, they know, they, they've, no, it's all under control. It's all very, I've seen a lot of fights and stuff in there and stuff will go down. You know what I've been scared at? People that come into the courtroom to watch a criminal trial that have a beef, that are mad that like someone's going to like testify or somebody was killed or wronged that they love. And they come in and they start a fight in the back of the courtroom. And it's really, that's what's scary, you know? Well, just to mention again, the Grenadier case, Dr. Grenadier, this esteemed allergist that everybody in the community respected, but his demeanor in the courtroom and his unwavering sense of, I didn't do this despite all the evidence. It's really weird. I mean, it just gives you willies. There was a case in uh, Framingham where I was living at the time. Some people remember it. It was brutal. A guy came home, killed his wife, uh, claimed that she burned the ZD or something and uh, disemboweled her and all this horrible, horrible stuff. And he's away forever now, but, uh, um, what what human beings can do to other human beings is just oh it's unbelievable you know jordan i had one right before covid and i was like i've had a few things that like i want to jump out of my seat but i can't one was there were cops in rosendale and they were on a surveillance for a drug house and something went bad that the guys got tipped off that you know these were cops undercover cops they almost killed those cops. And those cops were so quick and on the money. One cop saved the, the lives of like two other cops at the front door of this drug house in broad daylight, mind you. You know what? They brought those guys in. They had no remorse. I was sick to my stomach of the, of the disregard they had for those police officers. They were all cops in their 40s and early 50s with wives and children. And I'm telling you, they put their lives on the line for these scumbags. It was, I was, it was the most outrageous, Jordan, to control, I had to contain myself, but it was, it, it makes me so mad. Another time there were people that took somebody and left them on the railroad tracks with broken legs, waiting, like hoping they'd get run over by the train. Somebody else saw it and dragged the person, like she came in, the girl, one of the girl and the guy, that they that they left the body on the tracks. This was over um, by um, what's um, Back Bay Station, Jordan. She was laughing. She was laughing. She was in there for what she she thought it was funny. She was smirking through the whole. I couldn't believe it. I mean, just over the weekend there was a case in uh, New York where a lovely lady was just pushed onto the tracks by a, some lunatic and you lost her life. It's. We have to be so thankful that we have our safety. Let's go to another question. Getting back to process. This is from Jean, Carol Jean. Um, are the proceedings also recorded so you can go back and check? Well, that's a complicated question, but I'll, I'll tell you this. I have on my machine, I have a backup that records it. Now, when you first look at it, you'll go, what do you need you for? You're recording it. Did you ever take a recording with your friends and like hit play and record and like make a recording and then play back? It sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. You can't tell who's talking. <laughs> going, wah, wah. Wah, 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 wah. And I mean, Jordan, not to mention, you have a door slamming, someone's coughing, a, a witness is crying. They don't want to be there. Their head's down and they're giving testimony like this. You know, it, it, it's a safety net, but it's not going to cut it. If I ever played you back the recording, you'd be appalled. But another thing, they put what they call FTR in every courtroom across the Commonwealth. In 2018, it took effect. Those recordings, you can buy them. If you, I mean, anyone can buy them. You have to, you know, you have to fill out a form and buy them. 
Some parts of them are good. Some parts of them are garbage. And you know what? I've done this 31 years. There's no way that that recording will give you an accurate transcription all the way through. There's just no way. There's no way. There's too many things that go wrong during the... You can't tell who's talking. How can you tell who's speaking? I want to say thank you to Tom Harkins for putting up the picture now of Whitey Pulcher. <laughs> Did you want to say something, Tom? Because you're you got a hand up in the corner. Just unmute yourself for a second. Yeah, a couple of comments. First of all, I was at the Grinder trial. I watched that some of it, and that I agree that the the situation is the children. You know, as somebody described the children who have who are denying it, and uh, they, uh, uh, they as someone said, they just lost their mother. They didn't want to lose their father. You know, so that was one comment there. And the other thing, I was also at the trial of, uh, as a Notre Dame guy, I went to the Charlie Weiss trial. And I wasn't there the day Tom Brady was there, but I was the day, I was there the first day of the trial. Later on, that trial was very interesting because one of the jurors collapsed really? during the trial. And the judges, uh, the doctors who were on trial, yes, uh, being sued, came to his uh, aid. Came to his aid. And then the judge asked the jurors afterwards, did that influence you in this decision? And the, some, a couple of jurors said, yes. Did that, did that you know, look favorable towards the doctors? And they said, yes. And uh, so he declared a mistrial. And when it was retried, uh, Charlie, K, Charlie Weiss lost his case. And in the retrial, uh, yeah. in the retrial, uh, the retrial the, uh, uh, Tom Brady didn't testify. Well, you know, that's interesting because I've been on medical malpractice cases and we had one lawyer have a heart attack in the middle of it and the doctor getting sued ran to his aid and we had to call, they had to call a mistrial. So, you know. And, and Tom, can I just ask Tom a question, Diane? Yeah, of course. You're, you said you attended those trials. Is that just out of curiosity? Were you covering them or what? Oh, no, no, no. I was just... Uh, I was retired, like they say, a good thing to do is retired people do. Oh, and because okay. uh, I, as a Notre Dame person, the uh, one of the persons defending the doctor, his law firm was uh, was uh, was defending the doctors, and he uh, and he told me about the trial, so that's why I went in the first day. Are you an attorney? Oh, no, I, I I went to law school for one year. That was enough. <laughs> I'm a retired I'm a retired librarian. Oh, oh nice. They, came to the and, right and a trustee of the Needham Free Public Library. Oh, very good. And another we thing, have, is, is Sean Ellis, did you have to know that Sean Ellis is uh, was a, a Needham High School Medco student? That's right. That's right. That came lot, out. And a lot of a lot of people who supported him, one of the people who supported him a lot was the family of his host family here in Needham. That's right. Very interesting. Did you, did have, you watch that on Netflix? I did. I watched that thing on Netflix. Isn't that amazing? Uh, but he came to speak to... Uh, Diversity Initiative Day uh, a few years ago too, in Needham. Let's do Sean one more there. one more question, and uh, this is a, a doozy of a question, a great question from Barbara, and it's to Diane. But it, we can all ponder this. Do you think that criminals that have served their time have the right to have their slate cleaned, slate wiped clean? Do you mean like have their um, criminal um, conviction, ex like ex like? expunged or it sounds like that's what she's saying i don't want to put words in her mouth but that sounds well, like I, I don't know i i you know jordan i've never had that question before i really don't have an opinion on that i i don't know i know in today's boston globe there is a article about a, a gentleman who died in prison while he was currently uh appealing his case and while his attorneys have not asked, the uh, courts are looking at totally expunging the case totally. Even though he was guilty, he pled guilty, he was serving time for it. And yeah, that is probably what she's asking about. Do they, is that something that should happen? I know under English law that that is what used to happen is if you died while serving your sentence, uh, you were expunged, so to speak. But is that still what should be the current practice? Gee, I don't know. That's a good, that could be up for debate, but I, 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 I really don't have an opinion on that. But it's a great question that, is, that sure. Diane brought up and it, and it just goes to show you all, uh, us all, 
that uh, everything that we are talking about uh, really does impact us. You know, even though we're not in the courtroom, decisions are made that impact us all the time. Um, let me just see. Uh, this is from Carol Jean Thomas, who's actually on screen. Uh, very local. Dr. Grenadier was the allergist that one of my children saw regularly. Had a doctor definitely had a weird effect, even his professional setting. Yeah. When you think back, it's the old, uh, well, he was a quiet man. And, you know, it's always one of those things. Isn't that interesting, Diane? Huh? Well, the interesting, that court officer that was in charge of him for the trial, Bill, that was on our podcast, do you remember what word he used? Teutonic. Teutonic. Remember? Oh, yes, yes. The word Teutonic. Not, yeah. not describing soda pop here in New England, but uh, Teutonic, yeah. meaning German sort of stolid, Cold. stayed, you know, very interesting demeanor. Um, let me just say, because I know we have to wrap up, that if you are interested in, oh, hello, Mrs. Harkins. If you're interested in um, downloading the podcast, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. And Diane would, would really appreciate it to get more, more listeners because we're, what she's doing is really hard work. And she's done, I mean, she's so particular about getting everything right. And uh, she's very proud of it. And I'm very proud of her. So just go to any Google Center you want to go to, Google All Rise with Diane Godfrey. And it's available on Apple, Stitcher, Google, to every available platform. And if you have a, a podcast app, which is one is called the podcast app, you can download it easily. So that's it. You know, Jordan, if you even put it in the Google search bar, All Rise with Diane Godfrey, if you just put All Rise, you won't get it. There's many All Rise podcasts. You have to put with Diane Godfrey or you won't get it. But that's, yeah, all that's it true. Is. Just hit it and you come up to it and you can just listen. But, you know, for the future, if, while we have everybody here, if the stuff you want to, if you have ideas for podcasts, you can write it right now in the chat or you can write it to allrisediane at gmail.com. And I'm typing it in now just so everybody will have it. Okay. But, you know, we have like Hank Felipe Ryan's coming on soon because she wrote some crime books. And who else do we have? We have Joe Sharkey's coming back. He's going to talk about an FBI, a true story in Appalachia. An FBI agent had a lover and he killed her in, you know, in Appalachia. Who else is coming? I think we have one of the ex-DAs coming on. He said he We also have a, uh, a, and we are working on this, a um, the ballistician, is that what you call him? Yes, I'm trying to get a hold of him, the ballistician. I want someone, if they would be so inclined, I'm going to ask if somebody from the crime lab could come on and talk about- forensic. Ballistician is somebody who handles weapons. So we're talking about, you know, ammunition, weapons. And with the Alec Baldwin case, everyone's sort of keying in on guns, but it's fascinating. So all of this is coming up. That was a good tease, Diane. You know, that I, I, I agree with that, this whole thing about- um, once you get out of jail and you have a criminal record, it's really hard to make a go of it after. And I know firsthand personally, people very close to me, I know people that have done time and how it derailed their life forever. It's, yeah. you know, too, Jordan, I've learned one thing from working in that courthouse, smile your next. And I'm not at all trying to jinx anyone or say bad, Anyone could be in the wrong place, wrong time and do something and get arrested. And you know what? People, it could be your brother. It could be your, you know, your uncle. You could be your next door neighbor or your boyfriend or your husband. Stuff happens in this life. People I've seen that a Laura buying citizen, something will happen somewhere, somehow. And then they're in the soup and they're in the court. So it happens to even good people. They get in trouble. I'm telling you seen a lot of stuff. Well, let's let's turn things over to Gay uh, from the Needham Library. And again, thank you all very, very much for your kindness and attention. Thank you. Thanks, Diana everybody. Jordan, thank you so much for appearing tonight. It was, was fantastic. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the Library Foundation in Needham, who uh, were the ones who funded tonight's program. Um, they also have other programs that they are sponsoring in the next couple of months including a financial literacy workshop for ages 18 and up. The uh, one in February is called Managing Your Money to Build Your Best Life. Um, you can uh, find that at needhamlibrary.org events. That takes you to our event calendar. 
We also have upcoming the following events all on Zoom because our community room will be closed for yet another month. Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson will be talking about slavery in New England on Sunday, February 6th at 2 p.m. The first of the 2022 uh, MacGyver Lecture Series will be on Sunday, February 13th at 2 p.m. on Notable Needamites with Dr. Gloria Poli Polizzati Grice of the Needham Historical uh, Museum will be talking all about famous people from Needham. And finally, uh, we will be doing uh, for last time, Tammy Coxon will be doing Tammy's Tastings called Wartime Drinking uh, on Tuesday, February 15th. Uh, come prepared for uh, learning all about what happened during World War II when it came to liquor. <laughs> and uh, bring your bartending skills because we'll be sending you out the ingredient list and she will lead you in making cocktails. So have some, it's something to have a little bit of fun uh, for the month of February. So once again, thank you to everybody. And I am going to stop our recording. Bye-bye. Thank you.